Good afternoon. It's Joyful Hermit. And um, pain up again today. It's been sort of up and down. But the weather is shifting again. And I am, I'm getting my pain pump refilled in about a week. And I might even call to see if I could get in sooner and get it increased. But also, if not, because the pump has a tube that goes into my spinal cord dural space. And it uses one three hundredth of pain medication, of oral medication. So the point of the pump was to um, put that in there, into the cord area, to at least handle the pain of the lumbar that shoots pain down the hips and the legs and into the feet. And then I would take less, or hopefully no, oral meds, or very few oral meds. But as it's turned out, with my neck so severe now, and my upper spine bad, and my lumbar is bad, it's not like, like the pump uh, output is high enough to really handle it. And maybe I just need to ask the pain doctor, do you think I'm going to live another 50 years to be 122 and why we have to keep it so very very low so we have room to go with it over the next 50 years or something i mean arachnoiditis your life expectancy is 12 and a half years less than average so i figured out when my parents died and figure my genes are be similar and i should die within the next couple of years if I'm fortunate. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, yeah, it's just a lot of pain. So I also then read up on medication because I'm fatigued. That's the problem. I just live in bed mostly. So I read up on medications that they're now using now for chronic pain patients who have so much fatigue that they aren't functioning because I think otherwise I could function if I didn't have so much fatigue. Um, anyway, so that's just the temporal status. As usual, pain, pain, pain. But um, I've thought of another incident that demonstrates just how much God pays attention to our details in our lives and takes care of us. And, and this this thing I'm going to describe to you and share with you is an amazing supernatural event that occurred. And it also shows that Jesus uh, feels bad when we are kind of mistreated or discounted. And he comes through for us but and, ta and feeds us, takes care of us. But... Um, I don't mean to put down the person or anything that, that, that sort of, well, he was busy and just didn't want to deal with me, didn't want to listen, didn't want to hear what I had to say or that I was suffering. And uh, anyway, well, I'll get into that story. But I, the, my point is also that I've been thinking of is how in all the other times, day and night, that something isn't, wow, supernatural occurring, which is usually rare in our lives that those things occur. Or they occur and we don't notice them, or we come up with some reason for them, some practical reason or temporal reason. But that doesn't mean that God isn't taking care of us every minute of every day in our temporal world, in our temporal needs, and especially in our spiritual needs. And it's up to us to now and then take a little time to just ponder how he has arranged our lives for us. Or look back a little bit over your life and see how God reached in or God, God had this situation happen. And remove from the, your, your thinking that suffering is terrible and a material wealth or success is good. I saw something on Facebook, somebody had posted one of these memes or whatever it was, whatever they're called, little saying. It said, um, um, optimism 
plus positivity equals success? Well, it depends. People looking at my life, I'm no kind of success. I haven't used my doctorate. I wasn't able to finish the half a I had over another half a doctorate finished, plus I had intern hours of the clinical therapy in with counseling people before my pain made it obvious I couldn't have that as a career. So I never used that except to research. I use my doctorate degrees because I learned how to research. So I do a lot of research. Um, on the, on the computer, but I am at no way could be considered a temporal success. I, even as a mystic, I didn't have anything that the temporal church wanted that I had to offer. I was doubted. I was considered a problem. Don't come, you know, causing a problem. Other people notice you look asleep in your mystical ecstasy and it bothers people or, you know, they're asking questions and, oh, we don't want questions, you know. We don't want to have to say what's happening with you because, you know, we haven't proved it through science or something like that, you know. So it gets very temporal. We can't help ourselves because we are temporal. But our challenge is, is to move beyond the temporal. That's the challenge of coming close to God, who is with us in the temporal, but he is numinous, spiritual. He is, he was temporal for a while, approximately 33 years, temporal among us. But all the rest of the time, he's spiritual, he's mystical, and, but real. And the greatest power and force of anything. He's the creator. So consider, just take an hour of your day, consider the little things you've thought about or things that have happened or people that have called or you've had a nudge to call or whatever. Who was behind that? Who is orchestrating that? Who is allowing it to happen? And, and if it's something a negative happened from it, consider what you learned from the negative. I've had to reapproach my suffering. And even this fatigue, I've thought maybe God is allowing this so that I will do more videos. Or someone, a couple of people have mentioned, I need to write. I should write a book or something. And God knows. He knows that I need income. Maybe a book would bring in some income. But for now, the verbalizing seems to be what my body and mind can happen. And so I'm going with this. And God has blessed it with wonderful people leaving comments and um, suggestions and, and seem to be getting something out of it. Um, so I think we'll go with this for a while now and just see. And if I had more energy, get some more energy, then um, I can maybe focus more on writing. In writing, I could organize it better, and I could edit it and get things in sequence better. <laughs> Much better presentation, and probably more inspirational, because the words could be used in a way and my sentence structure better than wandering all over, which I do now. But I'm going to share this time. It was back probably in 2007, two, maybe 2008, before the ecstasy started during Mass. But I was having a pain siege, and I knew I wasn't going to be able to make it to Mass for the weekend. And I'd been asked to be a sacristan. Oh, I was so honored. I, I tell you, I just loved just being able to set up the altar for Mass and and remove things after and put them away. And it was just a reverent opportunity for me to serve in a way I had never been asked. So it was a tremendous honor for me. It was just after the Saturday or the Sunday evening Mass was was it was was my duty and before before setting up and after 
So, but, so I was in bed, laid flat, horrible pain, <clears throat> but I could talk, I could communicate, but it was, it was bad. And my voice would change when I would get in that kind of pain. But, um, and the uh, Monsignor was, he was uh, my confessor and he, he knew me well and knew all about my spiritual life and he wanted to know. And I, but I called him to say I, I wouldn't be able to come do that uh, i knew that the siege would last a few days and but i wanted to talk to him about some other things that had been going on spiritually well i could just tell he was bored he i could tell when he put me on his speakerphone and that he wasn't really listening and i even had mentioned about how i would love to have communion if i could just have communion i that would strengthen me for the suffering ahead. And and he didn't even comment, you know. He was shuffling papers. He was an administrator type, for one thing. But he was also had a, a spiritual depth to him. He was a lovely priest and a hard worker, very hard worker, and kind in his own way. But he also was sort of a... Uh, keep up with anything going on he was he he was in control and he also had OCD um, you know where he, everything had to be in order he couldn't stand things out of order I was probably good for setting up the altar because I was very particular to do it properly how I was trained to do it but he would, you know, go through the pews or shuffle things, get things all tidy and in order after masses and stuff. So he did have OCD. It was obvious. And that's why he finally got upset and admitted he did not like my mystical state because I wasn't standing during the reading of the gospel. Well, in other time periods, people stood all through mass. There weren't pews in Europe. And in cathedrals there today, some of the old ones, there's no pews. You just They stood through Mass. And before that, people would recline for worship. The Last Supper, they were all reclined. So, you know, this is these are just postures and rituals that have been de developed by humans um, for worship. And it's nice to have everyone unified. But he had me sit in the handicap pew. Um, <clears throat> with all the other handicapped, no one else was, there were these heavy people who, you know, who were heavy, older people. They didn't stand during the gospel, but he was so bothered that I wasn't standing during, maybe he thought that somehow in an ecstasy that God would have you still stand or something, I don't know. It's funny what people think or don't understand about ecstasies, but they weren't willing to read this book that I had found that explained it all. It was, it's called Mystical Phenomenon by Reverend Al, Monsignor Albert Farge. It was translated into English from French in 1926. It's out of print, but the Lord led me to that book and it explained this ecstasy. But anyway, that's this Monsignor who I was talking with and just trying to get through a little bit of suffering and explain something that had happened in my spiritual life and expressing how much I would love it if someone could bring me communion when I'm suffering. It would just mean so much and it would strengthen me. I felt it would strengthen me for the suffering, particularly when it was a rough one. Well, you know, when I could tell he wasn't even listening, I, I let him go. I thought, let this poor man off the hook. And I, um, and and the talking also distracted me from pain too. When at certain levels of the pain, I could talk. When it's super super bad, I couldn't talk. <laughs> but like in the other time, I was too ill to even think of calling anyone. When my aunt called me, and that other example of how God took care of me uh, through my mother, my deceased mother. But so I hung up. I didn't hang up on him. I said goodbye. I'm sorry. I know you're busy. Hung up. 
I was laying there just a few minutes more and in this position, but flat. I didn't I couldn't have my head up off the pillow. It was too much pain in my head. And off to my left stood Jesus. He stood right by the bed, just inches from the bed, standing there. And he spoke, he said, I brought you my body and my blood. And he handed me uh, in I opened my, he had me open my mouth. This was thought flashing. He thought flashed this. This is how we communicate when we're dead, as I explained, through thought flashing. Instantaneous. He was talking to me in that mode. But you understand it as words, but it comes instantaneously. Or as thought, you know, you understand. So I opened my mouth, and he put a host in my mouth. And then he dissipated into the into the air into the universe and uh wow you know it's only happened the one time but he was telling me that he cared that he knew i was suffering that he appreciated that i always offered my suffering for god and for the church for his church He's the head, and we are the body. And um, and also, I could tell that he responded because one of his earthly priests had just ignored me. Ignored me. His pa shuffling his papers, or maybe he was straightening his piles on his desk or something to get them just perfect. And I'm not putting down anyone with OCD. It's another personality disorder that is a rough one it's hard it's sort of imprisoning because things that are out of order really bother people who have OCD um, so you know I felt for him but um, he could have taken five minutes to talk with me and said, I will call a Eucharistic minister to bring you communion. Could have, but could have, should have, I guess. Um, but then, had he, I wouldn't have had that experience of Christ appearing and placing the host on my tongue himself, fed by Jesus Christ. And that then spread over in all my life for years even of uh, even now I have not hungered like that for the Eucharist I know I'm being fed I was fed through those uh, the ecstasies in a deep deep way but I know Christ is here right now right here in this room and with me in my my uh, lumbar hip down the legs and foot pain, which is nothing like the spinal headache uh, pain sieges I used to have. So um, it's, it's pain. It's not allowing me to be up doing things, but it's not totally debilitating me, in other words. So, um, but I don't myself think enough or have my awareness of in the details of my life that God is arranging things. He's laying out the path before us. He's planning our days with us. He's, he's with us in the night if we wake up. He's um, allowing what dreams we have or what not we don't have. He's... Um, having certain friends come into our life and other friends move on from our lives. I thought of with my adult children who have bamboozled and want to live their own lives and really don't want to communicate with me or um, they want their freedom so much that it's like an estrangement kind of a thing or major shift and the one is cut off totally. Uh, the other one doesn't respond at all, but if there were something serious, she would respond. And the other one would respond, but doesn't want to have closeness 
used to be far more close, has changed the level of sharing to only an as-needed basis. Um, so I thought about that today, and the whole thing shifted, that God had to have that happen, had to have them move away, because I have been hanging on to their lives ever since the divorce and my death experience when I was told I was to go back to rear my children. I took that very seriously. But maybe I've never really let go. And, and of what life I didn't have, I entered into their lives. I was very involved with anything that they came home to talk about from school or involved with their teachers or what schools they went to or their sports, their friends, their illnesses, any needs, anything. I was in on their lives in a big way, even more than a married mother would be because they were all I had. That they were why I came back. And I think, and then through the weddings and the first grandchildren, second grandchildren in one case, and um, but they started distancing, and which is, I think, normal. They individuated out, and I did, I did have my spiritual life. That, that was always there with them and after they left home. But I think psychologically, I have been not living my own life to the degree God wants me to live it now. For him and what he wants, as I was also sent back to fulfill my mission. So, trying to figure out this mission, and I'm doing this spiritual sharing. In the interim, maybe it's my mission, or at least I'm trying and God is blessing it. So, um, but I thought of that. I thought, I have been looking at this as if my children shouldn't have done this. You know, they, they shouldn't have cut off like this. And this isn't natural or isn't good. Until today, I thought, I think God had this happen because he knew, just like with the accident, with other, he always has to take such strident measures with me to get me to see the picture and to actually let go of other things that he that are in the way of what God wants me doing next. So consider that when you're thinking about how God is so integral and so involved in our lives, and especially if we've given our lives to him. He's trying to guide us, to lead us, to teach us, to provide for us, to feed us spiritually, mystically, um, temporally, all these things. He's involved in the temporal and the spiritual, the emotional, the mental, all of it, bodily, too. And and as our abodes and uh, gives us an angel, a guardian angel to help us, who I tend to not think about enough or thank or ask for added help from. So um, God is doing all this, but do we recognize it? And do we cooperate with him? And yes, you know, if he's standing right by our bed and thought flashing that he has brought us himself and to open our mouth and he places a host, that's something, yes, obviously, we are like, whoa. Jesus heard all that conversation, knew what I wanted, and delivered, came to bring it. So... Um, but he's doing that in other things that we aren't noticing and that maybe we should be because I'm now having a total different view and I'm not agonizing or grieving of the distance, distancing of my adult children. I'm now engaging more in God and what, how he wants me to live my life for him as a single person who reared her children and 
now is to be fulfilling her mission for God. So just some thoughts that I've had and that experience of, and of all, despite the sufferings and the horrible things that happen in our lives, some of you have had far worse than I've ever had. And like Dr. H said, oh my, you haven't even told them all of it. <laughs> no, I haven't. It gets worse. I mean, it gets bad and just as bad, or, but it's just the amount of crud in my life and the bad things. But, but is that really so terrible compared to all the good and also considering that I learned so much through all the suffering it changed my life. It changed my soul. He's honing me. He's honing me and, and creating me into a new being more to his, his um, will and desire. So in that way, then, no, it's, it's not bad. It's not terrible. So um, anyway, good thoughts, I hope, for all of us. And uh, just consider, leave some comments if you want on things that you have shifted now in realizing that God intended some of these things to happen for our benefit, not as a point of grieving, but um, for our good, for our betterment. God bless his real presence in us and let us continue loving, learning to love as God loves and exploring all that, how God loves. Until next time.